Hi, everyone. Thanks uh, so much to our four guests for joining us today. Uh, and welcome to everyone else who is watching online. Uh, this discussion about the series Fragments, Burmese Identities in Between, where we'll be discussing the work of four artists around this theme. So first, I'd like to introduce our four artists, Yasmin Allah. Could you wave, Yasmin, so everyone can see you? Hi. Yasmin Allah is a Rohingya human rights activist, poet, and chair of the board of human rights organization, Alt-Sien Burma. Born in the northern Rakhine state of Myanmar, her family fled to Thailand when she was a child, and she remained a refugee until moving to Canada 16 years later. In 2021, Yasmin was named on the Femilist 100, a list of 100 women from the global south, working in foreign policy, peace building, law, activism, and development. She's a member of the US campaign for Burma and published a collection of her poetry in the anthology, I Am a Rohingya. Thanks for joining us, Yasmin. Uh, Ma Chinde, can you wave for us, Ma Chinde? Ma Chinde is a Burmese writer, essayist, poet, and anthropologist from Yangon, currently residing in the traditional, ancestral, and historical meeting points of the Apache, Comanche, Sioux, Cherokee, and Iroquois peoples. She's pursuing her PhD in cultural and linguistic anthropology at the University of Colorado Boulder, and is the founder and director of Aruna Global South, dedicated to highlighting experimental work from scholars of marginalized backgrounds with interests in Asia and its diasporas. Her pen name, Ma Chinde, means lioness. Beautiful. Uh, Laming U, Laming U, can you wave hello? Laming U is an award-winning documentary filmmaker, director, and producer at Tagu Films, an independent production company he co-founded, dedicated to revealing the untold human stories of Myanmar. Born and raised in Myanmar, Laming U graduated from Gettysburg College, Pennsylvania, with a degree in psychology and philosophy, before returning to Myanmar to live in 2013. In 2016, Lamine U received the Power of Film Humanitarian Award given by Film Aid Asia for his documentary work. Thank you for joining us today. And finally, Sol Chan Tu Sang. There he is. Sol Chan Tu Sang is a community organizer and filmmaker from Yangon. Since 2015, he has organized cultural events such as concerts, fundraisers, a literary magazine, and community spaces as well as pursuing an online degree and making films. His film work explores themes of identity, loss of mother tongue, incompleteness, and sunyata, the Buddhist concept of emptiness. Thanks for joining us today. And just to put it all in context, I'm Saeed Teji Farooqi. I am a Palestinian, Egyptian, British filmmaker and educator. In August, 2021, after filming in Myanmar for three and a half years, I released A Thousand Fires, a documentary about a Burmese family living in the Magwe region of Myanmar, living and working in a hand-drilled oil field. In May of 2021, the Burmese attempted coup and a renewed Palestinian uprising coincided. And the film became for me an expression of shared solidarity between the Palestinian and the Burmese people. Hopefully that explains what I'm doing here today. So with that, um, I'd like to start really with the main theme here and talk about fragmentation because so much of your work seems to be about it and so much of contemporary politics uh, in Burma seems to be about it. So I, I wonder um, how you tackle the idea of fragmentation in your work um, and also how your work can, can heal fragmentation. So anyone who would like to start, please jump in. So I can ask, for example, specifically, um, Sol, with your film, you have a specific reference to language in the film and how use of language or forgetting language distances you from your Chin ancestry. Can you tell yeah. us? Uh, thank you, Saeed, um, for introducing us. And 
Thank you, Blair, for organizing this. Um, I think in terms of fragmentation in my work or in the world today, I think we, you know, there's a, I, almost like a keyword that's been floating around diversity, you know, this is like what the liberal, the progressive is trying to, you know, label as the keyword. And I think diversity comes from within. And even within ourselves, we have many characters that are diverse. You know, when we talk to our parents, we're a different character. When we talk to our lovers, we're a different character. So that fragmentation of self begins and I think it amplifies now with you know the mass media platforms that sort of allows you to isolate or you know be within one circle and not interact with other circles. So I think the work of fragmentation it's a very personal uh personal phenomena and it sort of expands out into society as we know it but as our work as artists and I feel like I'm among my family with you know Machente, yes Yasmin and Kulamin because I feel like this is the people that <laughs> you know that people have guide me and have worked with me and are working on the same issues pressing issues that I'm interested in but when when that happened, right? Like when our fragmented selves, even though we have many personalities, we can come together on certain issues, we can come together on certain practices. And that sort of is what I try to do to, you know, sort of heal from fragmentation, to create art and to create, to build communities through art, I suppose. Yeah, that's my <laughs> Yeah. No, that's very powerful. And uh, Yasmin, did you want to? I think I want to um, actually first acknowledge that um, I am currently, you know, speaking with you and, and I am with you virtually, but I am operating on an unceded ter traditional territory of the KC, Semiamo, Kwantlen and other Coast Salish people. Um, and unceded means that the land were never surrendered or given up so that you know, I and others are currently operating on a stolen land. Um, with that out of the way, because of set settler colonialism being the linkage um, to all of us being here, um, the fragmentation of self and fragmentation of um, community, uh, unfortunately, seem to have also stemmed from that line of, you know, oppression, um, historical oppression, but also um the the kind of institutions that were instilled within our country um in order to further drive away people and one of the ways that um the rohingya genocide was was successful um or is currently you know still succeeding um is by way of erasing um the self um and the community from, you know, from one another. And because we are so diverse as, you know, as was already mentioned as a country, um, that is also a point of contention. We, we exist in a paradox. Um, and in, in that sense, um, I myself and, and as I've witnessed, you know, others work, um, uh, work of art or, you know, advocacy or, or any sort of, you know, um, uh, sort of resistance that exists within the space often comes from this need to reconcile the self and the, you know, the communal self, but also the individual self, um, almost trying to understand what has been happening. Um, and again, like no one can really make sense of oppression because it's, it's not supposed to make sense. Um, hatred never makes sense. Um, there, there are a lot of components of this that, that we would never be able to actually intellectualize. But at the end, um, I think what, what really drove me to write poems, especially on identity, on, on, you know, on the kind of violence that took place against our community is that there is this sense of yearning that um, unfortunately can never really 
uh, it's there's almost like a, a a hole in my heart that I can't really fill. Um, and I, I don't actually know how to, to address it. Um, so this yearning continues. Um, and this yearning exists because there are multiple waves of violence that you know, no matter how how much I brace for it, uh, no matter how how prepared I think I might be, and no one can really be prepared for violence at this scale, um, it still hits me like a, a ton of break. And you know, watching your your own people having to go through hardship one after another, especially you know um, things that revolves around water. And I talk a lot about, you know, the, the, the idea of being embraced by water because we're coastal people. Um, that in and of itself kind of weave together this, 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 this problem that I have within, um, within the community, trying to reconcile being a, a person now within that diaspora, um, maybe struggle a little bit less um, in comparison to other people within my community um, and that, that survivor guilt um, while also trying in some ways to uplift the people who are currently struggling. So there isn't really one answer to, to why or, or how or what fragmentation looks like, but it's it's this like several pieces that have to come together and you know, at the end of the day, we carry that fragment itself everywhere we go. Um, mm. And we, we don't really have an answer to, you know, to there's no silver bullet to answer, you know, who you are or, or you know, what your community has gone through. And I think this is this is somewhat of a, a shared experience throughout um, the country, especially within the ethnic um, um, nationalities and, and minority groups. Yeah, the, I mean, you know, I started out asking about fragmentation, implying it's a negative thing. But I think in, in all of your work, all of you as well, there is a sense that maybe this multiple identity can actually be a positive or a, a source of strength. Um, how do you uh, how do the others feel about that? I know Machin Day, for example, your poetry, I got this sense of a very complex set of identities. and and sometimes the character in your poems almost seems to uh, feel comfortable in that, find some comfort in it. Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, thank you again also for Sai for intro introducing us. And I think Yasmin and Saul have beautifully said what, you know, fragmentations kind of um, means to them. I was also gonna say like kind of echoing Sai that for me, kind of when we talk about fragments, it has this negative connotation. And sorry, my voice is like really uh, painful today. But but for me, when I think about fragments, it has some sort of beauty in it, right? And uh, with the with the poetry or the art, I mean, we can talk a little bit about whether or not I feel comfortable calling myself artist. That's another conversation because you know you introduce uh to all of us as artists and I'm not sure if I could call myself an artist but oh I definitely think you're you're an artist thank you yes but again that's the another fragmentation of maybe identities that we can talk about right and in my own scholarly works I also look at the Bavis diaspora so I don't look at and uh work with the people inside the country so the di diaspora itself is fragmented and Saul mentioned this very beautiful idea of or concept of the diversity right but I feel like when I look at myself and when I write the poetry or the art that you call it or something, is a lot of a lot of it's coming from coming to me in fragments. Mm -hmm. Is the compilation of fragment, fragments of memories, right? And and I think as an anthropologist, not necessarily as an artist, who are we as human if we don't have fragments of memory? We go through life every day, we are touched by memories. We are touched by moments that are then made into memories. But those are all selective moments that we carry as memories. So when I think about the people in the diaspora or people in between the diaspora, in transients, motions, we carry those fragmented memories. And what, which one that you choose to carry and which one that hit me, like what Jasmine said, like a crash you know, at, at your foot in her beautiful 
poem. Yeah, that's how I think about fragments. So I don't know, it's, it has this very beautiful sense. So, and beautiful quality. Um, so yeah, that's how I think about it, but yes, thank you. I thought also, was that a reference to the, the lines about the waves crashing at my feet in, in Yasmin's poem? Which I, for me, yeah, for me, it, it, actually it was that line that made me think because waves have this incredible power that can be destructive, but at the same time, this idea of the waves continually moving, I felt like there's a real strength in this regeneration. It's almost a new wave every time and it's endless, it never dies. So somehow for us who maybe have these very complicated identities, we have the, the ability to uh, regenerate or see ourselves in a different way over and over again. And that, I mean, in your film, Nami U, the, this idea of dual identities was very, you know, it's at the forefront in, in a kind of very clear social way. And I also felt with those characters, that journey of self-acceptance or the journey of also social acceptance is really quite fascinating. That, that society can accept an ident a gender identity that is not fixed, that's not obvious. Um, hi, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, good to be here talking to uh, you all. Uh, obviously in a very intelligent uh, company, so uh, great to be with you all. <laughs> um, yeah, in terms of um, fragmentation, like even before I, I talk about like the film that I made, like I feel like I live in kind of like a fragmented, like soft every single day. Um, and I, maybe I, I know this uh, before, maybe I, I didn't, but it's more highlighted now after, you know, I'm, I'm still in Yango, right? I, I live in Yango. So to in order to live in Yango safely, there's an identity that I have to have. Mm -hmm. And um, there is the other side of, um, you know, uh, news that you see every day, uh, news that you read every day, people that you 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 could help but you couldn't, or um, and that is I know I know it might be beautiful but it's really painful <laughs> um, yeah. to go to to go to go through. Um, I think saw saw experiences as well because he was here uh, just a couple of months ago. So it's. Um, I, I don't know what like I don't know what healing looks like uh, for me particularly right now uh, but it's I don't know it I, I feel like I'm being changed in a way that I don't want to uh, and I feel like I don't have I don't really have control over like that change I think that that is a I don't know that's a that's a huge struggle uh personally for me um and uh yeah and speaking of, about the characters uh in my film um i know you know uh guado uh, the the father uh character you know um he doesn't talk about like things that he has struggled so much uh when when he was growing up uh, he, he told me a lot off camera but I imagine like how much he must have to uh, fight for uh, his own little space, his own little identity that everybody can accept. Uh, and, and, and the effort that he, he goes through to be accepted. Um, um, and, you know, he's good with his hands. He can build things, he can make things, uh, he can climb like trees, but all these effort he has made so that you know he get to to a place where you know he he can sit with man uh, at at, at Shinju, uh Debo, uh, you know, which is uh, very consider you know a man's place. Um, so yeah, I I think I think it's a it's a tough journey, um, and uh, and I'm I'm glad I, I, I mean in a way um, I I could capture this person's like success in a way. Um, of of being able to um yeah being able to exist uh with pride and dignity um so 
Yeah. And it's, it's, I think it's, it's a more, journey. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think in a way the film's more powerful because it doesn't go into Guado's past and, for example, struggle with identity. That, you know, the film begins with this assertion, uh, Guado as a father, and, and that's it. It's a much more radical stance, which I find incredibly beautiful. And then, and then so for me, that moment when he's able to uh, give, a, give up his son in the Shimbu to the monastery, and that for him was such a particular symbol of being accepted as a father becomes really much more beautiful because it's almost like this struggle has succeeded in a way. And I'm curious how, um, because I guess when, when we talk about the regime in Myanmar and all the challenges, one of them is also social. That's sort of the focus of your film, not so, not so much political, but the social challenges. So what is the, um, social climate now for, for you two as filmmakers in Myanmar? You know, are, what sort of film language is acceptable or not acceptable? How do you have to navigate that system to operate? Is that something um, you can talk about? Yeah. Um, so the, in terms of film, the main, mainstream uh, commercial film industry has been dead since COVID. Cinemas closed down since then, and then the crew followed, and um, and uh, cinemas are still. I mean, not they're reopening slowly now, but no one's making new film to be shown in the cinema. So in that sense, like that side of uh, uh, the 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 filmmaking, like it's not possible. Um, uh, for us, we've been doing more independent, like short films and documentary, which we don't really show within the country, um, mainly aimed towards like international film festivals and so on. So we don't really get that much attention from, uh, from, from the government or any government, really. We don't really get that much attention. Um, so I, most of us are still being able to operate in a way that that still feels safe for us uh, but still trying to tell anything real or anything that we actually want 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 to show uh, that's currently not possible um, so um, so <laughs> Uh, a friend of mine uh, who 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 works at the Goo as well. He's making uh, a film about uh, bird watchers. Um, totally <laughs> off, uh, not political, but environmental and also self uh, kind of ex you know self also it kind of relate to identity, kind of searching for his own identity kind of thing. So uh, in terms of like working on what kind of project we're working. Um, uh, it kind of have to be non-political and uh, um, and even when we make films, I think films, uh, I think the independent short films from Myanmar are becoming more and more leaning towards experimental uh, kind of look because it's a safer way to express uh, what you really want to express. Right, indirect or a metaphorical or and it has the potential for a new film language. I mean, I think, for example, of Iranian cinema that has such a specific form because it's had to operate under very strict rules. Uh, and Sol, what are your thoughts on the, on the climate of working now as a filmmaker? Yep, <clears throat> I think, so I actually worked at, under Gulam Ewu at the Ku Films for, almost two years, I suppose, since oh, COVID. Okay. Great. Um, and working at the Goo, I think one thing that I began to realize is, yeah, we're trying to tell, I think what, you know, Lame Wu and the, my seniors at the Goo would try to push me in, not, not directly, I would say. They would never say like, oh, make this film. They would just be like talking with me to tell stories that are much more, either not a lot of people are voicing, you know, like for example, the current mil military, uh, the regime is a, is a sort of amped up topic. And I feel like as artists, as filmmakers, as documentary filmmakers, there's just so many stories around us 
within us that we can explore that um and i feel like uh my experience of working in myanmar has allowed me to explore much deeper of you know what i care about and it's a little i would say like if i were to critique myself i would say it's a little bit egocentric but i think it it's a very important thing just to because uh, just to like allow yourself to tell some things that you don't usually express in your day-to-day life and something that might be you know weighting your mind that might be always pressing you at the back of your head but you're not like saying it all the time to everyone so an art and filmmaking becomes like a very powerful and um tradition a powerful tradition to express things that we don't usually express so i've been very also lucky another thing is um making money with films is a very hard thing in myanmar and I, it's i don't know how but somehow things have you know lined up in a way that helped help me survive and i would say like having my parents support so i'm running my parents business as well that sort of helped me make films without having to worry about you know going into commercials or going into advertisement as much as um other filmmakers are pressed to do yeah yeah and and i mean this idea of navigating the the, the politics it makes me wonder also if if you see all of you you see art as a form of resistance as a, as a form of political resistance in for example in palestine we have a very uh, long tradition of militant cinema where the filmmakers explicitly saw themselves as fighters uh, even though they you know their weapon was a camera but they they fought alongside armed resistance fighters and believed themselves to be fighters in in a literal sense um so what what are your feelings on that yasmin and machinde i know but both well yasmin i know is more explicitly involved in in political activism um i, I can go first uh what um what i've witnessed within my community is there is again like you know on on the on the subject of fragmentation there there is this continuous um uh effort for people to basically you know the, the i think the highest or the strongest form of resistance that our community have been able to actually almost perfect it is is the is the um a survival and the 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 ability to continue to survive in a climate where you know everything is hostile towards you like systemically um culturally socially economically that you know looms over us wherever we go within the country elsewhere you know in the diaspora that never goes away um so what what my community has been doing is combating erasure with almost trying to hold on to the the culture that we have left um or you know whatever change that that has come about um in a way that um in a way that is you know almost like reclusive um to the community that we have uh whatever culture whatever tiny tiny remnants of of the culture that that we think has been taken away we try to almost amplify it a lot more mm -hmm. um and through this we see you know for example um prior to to you know other attempts to alienate other attempts to systemically erase rohingya out of um out of the country or out of the history of um of the country the the one thing that was taken away first was the radio station um uh, not the radio station sorry the radio program that would air um in rohingya language and you know it would it would talk about different things um that the community sees as important and so when when that happens is uh you know the 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 community felt a little bit more uh sort of almost like they they're you know they're 
important uh, work has been taken away and they're no longer visible. And that slowly becomes, you know, the theme of our struggle for the next like few decades. Um, so what the community has done is, you know, throughout the history, as we have more access to gadgets and, and digital, you know, uh, uh, device, we basically push out all of these different um uh, songs and different uh, poems, and it's one specific form of poetry that that exists within the communities called tarana, and that's basically sang by anybody who can sing, um, uh, and and it's a communal thing where people actually come together and and they would listen to this person sing usually that's back in the day but now it, it can be put out into um, a more digital form it's accessible anywhere in the world so people would sing about you know things that they really admire in a person for example like someone donated to a to a group of people who needed help that's going to be sang about um and it's 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 this sort of like beautiful way of combating this erasure that exists outside of the community while the community is trying to hold on to each other um, and and create that space for themselves while also you know acknowledging that we're going through something really really tough um, and that sort of you know gave me gave me a lot of strength in terms of where you know where we need to go um, and that's I think that's for 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 you know of course like apart from from other form of resistance and art that explicitly um you know dissent against the 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 military or or the regime um this is another form of resistance that i think is is a bit a bit less noticeable a little bit more silence um and and i think it needs a little bit more of a, a, a acknowledgement that that's also hard that's that's also you know um difficult to do as generations go on and 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 we forget why we actually started that in the first place and do, do you feel like some of these cultural elements become more important when you live in the diaspora because the, you're not surrounded by them all the time i i know in for example machinde in your poetry i feel like there's a lot of references to ritual um Yours, I guess, is unique in a way because you you would have written them in Burmese. So I'd be curious also to ask you about translation. But your poems seem to um, hold on to and embrace these rituals. Um, you wrote a lot about how rice is cooked. That was very evocative for me, especially because rice is such a big thing also in Arab families and the smell of rice um, and how we cook our rice. And so that wasn't really a question. I'm just I'm just evoking the the soul of your poetry. Yes. Uh, was that for Yasmin or for well, me? For you, for you, yeah, Machindi. Yes, I, I was also going to say, and going back to the point I said about whether or not I call myself an artist, right? And I think I do think of myself as a writer. Mm -hmm. And I wrote somewhere, I don't remember where or who wrote it. A writer is a, someone who observes really closely. And I really resonate with that statement, right? I don't know where I saw it because I like to observe. Maybe that's also why I'm an anthropologist. And Saul said that for his film, I really enjoy his film too, um, or their film, of Underneath My Chin, because even though I'm not a uh, chin, it has a lot of uh, common things that I resonate with, right? I don't call those kind of art form or writing or, or film as egoistic thing. So if you're really a writer or if you're really, um, you know, reflecting is is auto ethnographic, right? And as a writer, not only am I observing other people, I like to observe myself too, and that's how I produce my write, uh, writing. I don't even know if they're like I'm not trained in any kind of poetry poetry writing, so I don't know what are the techniques, but I observe, and that observation then evokes those fragmented memories that I grew up with that I did not even know they have been stick to my body, right? And going back to that, if then we call this writing as an art form and whether or not art is a resistant, even if it's not a resistant, I think any kind of observation, self-reflection is political, I think. It is political not only in Burma because we live in a global capitalist society, right? So our bodies are always have always been oppressed 
we encounter even when we are sitting on the couch, we're being oppressed, if you really think about it, right? So only when you pay attention, when, when you observe those moments, you observe your body and how your body has been oppressed, and you act on that observation through writing or through filmmaking or painting or whatever, that it is already political. Whether or not that, that action do the resistance, I don't know. That's the question. I don't know whether or not my poetry or my writing does the resisting. I don't know, but I know it is political. Political. So I'm also here recalling, you know, the black feminist Audre Lorde's 1985 very famous essay on poetry is not a luxury, right? Mm -hmm. Especially for black women, women of color, where you know the black women are even way more oppressed than all the other oppressions that. Uh, other people, the different population, different groups face, right? So then in order for uh, people who are who belong to those oppressed groups, different oppression, different intersecting oppre oppressions, for us to sit down and reflect on ourselves, that is a that is the form of resisting, right? Because the system mm -hmm. wants you to keep on going, keep on running. How can you take a pause and look at yourself and then write about it? How can you afford a time and luxury to do that? So I really resonate with that. Um, you think yeah, that's really the case or or, you, or now uh, under the new regime? I'm sorry, I missed your first part no. of the question. Do you think that's always been the case in Myanmar or is it now under the new regime? With the, the art as a resistance or? Yeah. I think the oppression did not happen just with this regime. Mm -hmm. I think. Oppression has always been there. I think if you go and look but look at even the pre-colonial time, right? There is a form of monarchic oppressions mm. on the subjects of the kings. And then you look at colonial time, there is oppression as a colonial subjects. And then we then as a women, right? There has been the bomb and misogyny and patriarchy. So the regime is, I mean, I don't want to downplay the regime, but regime is a kind of crystallization and materialization form of the op oppression. But in there, there are so many uh, kind of um, maybe form of oppression that we cannot just name. Maybe the art is a way to name that. Art is a way to get at that, maybe around poking at it, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Or, or a way of asking those questions. I've always thought of it as a way of, you know, of interrogating those, those um, oppressions. Um, yeah, so did you have your hand up? Yeah, uh, speaking of, uh, I think that was beautifully put, Machente. Um, that was a very insightful comment on what, you know, what we, why are we making art, right? Like, why are we giving our time to express and, examine and reflect and i think another thing that i want to build on top of your point was um in terms of resistance we talk a lot about maybe regime resistance you know the ruling class who's going to be the ruling class but the main resistance i think happens in cultural like cultural revolutions mm -hmm. in cultural resistance and there are many ways that I think art becomes, you know, in line or become an advocate for the changes that we want to see. But sometimes, even when it's not overtly, you know, like, oh, we hate this government or we hate that government, there is some sort of, I think, resistance that happens because you're breaking or you're creating a new culture of your own or a, not your of your own, but a culture that might be, you know, in line with what we believe in, what we value. And I think art is a very, art is the path to create the cultural changes that we want to see. And it, it's not a very, um, we were talking a lot about fragments, right? And how, um, you know, the systems that sort of control us, the ruling class, I think their main agenda, even if they don't say it explicitly, has always been to fragment or to divide us. Divide and conquer is a big thing that the British are used. 
So in terms of creating art and you know bringing in a new culture that would divide those uh, that would like you know reconcile those divides is a very important and powerful aspect of making art and communities that built around are built around art i think yeah and i, I wonder Both if that's nice. even more poignant or profound in in myanmar because I mean, you have a, at least officially recognized, you know, 135 ethnic groups. Of course, there are more that are not officially recognized, but the country has always been a project of, of keeping these separate nations together almost. There's a nationalized, right? And at times you feel like it's struggling that those bonds may not be as successfully held together as you think. And of course, the government's use of those fractures as a political tool. But the, I mean, when you talk about social pressures or social oppressions, maybe the ones that are not explicitly political. Also, I think about Laming U, the way you describe your work as, as hit, you know, these covered stories, you want to uncover the hidden stories about Myanmar. That these, to me, I think maybe you're talking about stories that are exactly this, where the truth is being hidden because of social tradition or social pressure or patriarchy or conservatism. Um, I think, um, um, let's see, the, a couple of thoughts in my head that I'm trying to get around. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think, uh, firstly, let's go with Machende's comment about artists or not artists. Um, uh, I also don't consider myself an artist. I consider myself a storyteller. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think that feels more truthful. I think whenever I make a film, I don't go out to say like, okay, my main goal is to create art. I think my main goal is always to tell the story um, uh, as truthfully with the small t <laughs> uh, as I can. Um, and And so in terms of like, also, another uh, you know uh, element that we touched on. That's why 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 we do what we do. Uh, I do it because I enjoy it, and I do it because I feel like I'm good at it. I think those are also uh, two very important things that that drive me to do what I uh, what I want to do. And whether you're creating art or not, I think, especially especially under this regime, very. It's very apparent to me that um, doing doing what you want to do uh, is a form of resistance um, because I think at the end of the day, um, you know, we want to say what we want to say and we want to do what we want to do. And those are the things that are being kind of, you know, being taken away from us. Um, and if we cannot, you know, say, um, political things on Facebook. Uh, it's always in, you know, discussion uh, among friends. Uh, the way we talk uh, about soldiers, the way we talk about, uh, you know, how we get through each day. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's a form of uh, resistance. Um, yeah. And sometimes I think, you know, um, I'm 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 still like you know comfortably uh, alive in Yango, uh, even though you know some sense of um, uh, freedom of expression has been taken away from me. I think uh, there are a lot of people uh, in you know, especially in the ethnic area, where you know being alive it's already a resistance. <laughs> Uh, in a lot of way, I have a lot of friends who are, you know, struggling, struggling in uh, in the borders. Um, so, yeah, it's yeah. Mm. I don't know. I don't know, man. <laughs> That's all I wanted to say. Neither do I. We're just, we're just here to ask questions, you know. <laughs> to ask questions. We, um, we are unfortunately nearing the end of the time, so we do have to wrap it up, but I wonder uh, if, we can, if we can end with a, another thought that 
I think in a way you're quite lucky in Myanmar because at least from my perspective, you have a long tradition of quite active poets in particular. Um, you know, I think of the many poets from the 88 generation that were, that, that was really their weapon and they continued writing uh, in prison. And then even under the current regime, people like uh, Chetty, poets who were targeted specifically for being, you know, resistance artists, um, whose only crime really was to write poetry. But, but I wonder, um, maybe Yasmin, you can tell us, is there a tradition that inspires your work in that sense, because you have this a real uh, well of very talented, active artists in your country. Um, I, I think that's, I think that's almost like a no brainer. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's, there's a long tradition of us creating art in different forms, and probably in forms that are a little bit. Um, a little bit less recognizable through, you know, settler colonial lens um, and, and in a capitalist sense, as, as Machinte was talking about, there's, there's less, um, less of that like emphasis, but now, now obviously art is available in, in so many different forms and in forms that are a little bit, a little bit more digestible. Um, you can see art forms in, in, you know, the, the infrastructure architect that, that, you know, exists everywhere around, um, around the country. And those were also the target of, um, of the regime. Um, whenever the regime wants to actually target a community, they would try to um, not only destabilize this, this sense of community, but they're also targeting these, these heritage sites in order to um, further drive that wedge within, you know, into the community in order for them to feel like I have nothing left um, because this physical presence of, of, you know, history and our ancestors working um, or, or their existence um, in the past really was, you know, now destroyed. So we see that in Morocco, um, in, in Rakhine State, um, where uh, during and after and to this day, there's still continuous fights uh, between the Arkan army and, and you know, the, the Myanmar military through basically like using that as a battleground, whereas mm -hmm. it is a heritage site, not just for the Rakhine people, for the entire groups of, um, of, of people that, that have lived in Arakan for a very long time. And so that really, like, that, that sense of loss will, will, you know, will remain present within the community for, you know, the foreseeable future. So that art form, you know, is, is slowly being, being targeted. Other art forms um, like poetry and, and writing has been, you know, established as, as a main form of, um, of resistance, um, as you've already mentioned. But, but I also think of um, uh, the ways that within my community, for example, you know, apart from the Tarana that I talked to, talk to you about where, where we try to um, almost document everything through singing and through talking about it uh, and making it a little bit more digestible to the audience. Um, whereas, you know, like other forms of um, news and, and information would exist um, and, and it, it doesn't penetrate the heart as well as, um, uh, you know, when, when you sing about it. But there, there, there are, you know, art forms that, um, that women try to preserve, like through sewing, through, through embroidery, through, you know, various other um, means. And, and those are sort of at a crisis right now um, because people have, have better things to do, especially, you know, surviving through, <laughs> through a war crimes, through a mass atrocity. Um, but, but as people are, you know, passing that down to the next generation, to the people within their family, it sort of continues this, like this, this, this um, uh, uh, almost a combat against, you know, erasure. Um, and one of the ways that I'm currently trying to do this with, and and I hope this is okay. Um, you can cut this out if if it doesn't work. But this is the book that I just. Oh, let me actually adjust my. Um, uh background this is the book that i wrote about um part of our culture where we we weave 
um, grass, specifically pandan grass or screw pine grass, um, into mats and you know things that we use on a daily basis. And these you know these these grass obviously are sustainable, but also it needs replacement every few months. Mm -hmm. And so what what my community would do is is we actually do this as a collective activity. So the entire neighborhood would come and help this one family. Whereas um, you know when when the other family needs it, we would also go. And it's almost like a, a community gathering where people talk about different you know aspect of oral history different stories folk tales are shared and children are also involved in this so this art form is also being forgotten um unfortunately in in the diaspora um especially in 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 places where um basic necessity are not met um like in the refugee camps in bangladesh so in one way this is my own way of trying to preserve that while also like giving a middle finger to the to the regime and say like you can't really take this from us we're not going to let you um and and i think that's that's i think the, the most anyone could do is is to continue on that legacy that we've had for a very long time within our own country um by not just trying to survive but also you know take the and and treasure the parts of of um of life that make us all you know um make our make our uh, culture really really beautiful yeah that's very beautiful and very powerful and i feel like that's uh, that's what all of you are doing you know as you create this continuity of asserting your identity through your work and that's a way of of directly challenging oppression genocide cultural cultural suppression whatever it may be um does anyone have any final thoughts uh, as we wrap it up? It's been very intense and, and moving and really illuminating for me as well. Maybe um, I could kind of... Yeah. Oh, sorry, cool. I mean, okay, go <laughs> Yeah, I, I see. Um, yeah, I, uh, I think I just want to uh, appreciate the poets and, and, and the company here in this discussion. Um, uh, I remember uh, when I was in my 20s uh, with my best friends, when we were going through, you know, heart wrenching heartbreaks, uh, we turned to poetry and we jokingly said, poetry is our last defense. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, what we jokingly said, I think it's literally true. Um, poetry is our last defense. Um, because um, at the end of the day, the, it, it's poetry that, you know, uh, makes you think about yourself and your soul and, you know, uh, makes you see things that you don't see. And uh, that, you know, and we've been talking about art as in resistance. And uh, yeah, I just want to say poetry is our last defense. And uh, um, yeah, appreciate your work. Yes, um, I was also gonna say that um, with my work, uh, as Yasmin beautifully said about kind of through this kind of knowledge preservation, right? We kind of, or heritage maintenance, we kind of plant the seeds for the next generation. Mm -hmm. What I wanna do is also with my work, in addition to that early, is also tying back to the theme of fragment, that to tell, because, Again, right? Bama is fragmented. When we talk about Bama, we're not talking about same thing, right? We're talking about different people. Like what kind of Burmese I am versus what kind of Burmese Saul is or Yasmin is or Lami is or not is different. So what, what I want to do with my work is it's okay to be who you are and don't necessarily just be a Burmese in the diaspora, especially to the diaspora people, right? Like people who grew up, especially now with this regime, there are many people who are fleeing the country and there's a lot of guilt that carry around that. And I work closely with the people who recently fled or the people who were born here, born outside, right? And they have a lot of guilt and shame and not knowing this culture that they were supposed to know. And I think it's okay. Like I have gone through a lot of how to be okay with that fragmented stuff. And I want my work to do that, even though I write in Bamese. You don't need to understand everything that I'm writing, every single word that I'm writing. 
but you you understand the feeling and I think that's good enough so yeah that's what I want to say for the conclusion thank you that's fantastic um so any last thoughts I guess thank you for for this discussion it, it's thank very you. insightful and I'm very glad to see and get to know everyone in the discussion and I feel like this is already you know we're resisting against fragmentation in a sense because this is a very global discussion that's happening mm -hmm. in in a yeah in one one morning for me and one evening for you know for yeah. me, I guess <laughs> and, but, and hopefully it, you know it creates new networks and new communities like your communal art projects so that you run in Yangon. Yeah. Um, thank you all for sharing your incredible work with us. Uh, I, I'll still call it art, whether you consider yourselves artists or not, but I really appreciate it. And also the time to join the panel, the discussion, your contributions. And I want to express my solidarity with the incredibly brave people of the resistance in Myanmar and wish them luck and wish all of you luck. And hopefully we'll see new work from you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. You too. Yeah.